of uh, reminder, something we learned in our Believe curriculum this last week, is that the, 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 type, the topic was the aspect of worship. And uh, I'm quite certain, I did a little quiz with each of the classes as we were going through it, and, um, and it, it rang true. I thought, I thought it would be what I thought, and, uh, and that is, when I say the word worship, I'm of the opinion that each of you think a certain thought. Worship, oh, like, like what we just did. And we have a worship team, and we have worship songs, and we have worship time in our service, and, and we go to worship, and I can't wait to go to worship again. And that's great. I understand all that. Well done. That is an accurate understanding of the word worship. However, it has a broader definition also. Worship is that which is done in the glory of Lord Jesus Christ, that which is done to acknowledge God for who he is. And therefore, we can spend our entire week worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? So may we continue to do that. May we continue to our worship by looking into his word that we might acknowledge God for who he is and he has said, this is my word, study it, know it, do it. And I think we can bring a, an offering of worship through our study of his word. So let's do that today. The, uh, <clears throat> the sermon, the topic, the verses that we're gonna be covering today um, weigh heavy on my heart, uh, and that is because of it's, it's uh, getting into your life a little bit. It's going to be possibly stepping on toes. I'm aware of the fact that as you consider the uh, course of human history, and certainly the, the Christian church, the Word of God, how that has impacted people throughout the centuries, are you aware of the fact that uh, sermons can divide people? That... Uh, Someone may look at a passage of Scripture and say, well, this is what it says. And someone else looks at the exact same per verses of Scripture and says, and this is what it says. And it's like, they're not the same thing. They're disagreeing. And uh, that's, a, that's an odd thing, is it not? You would think it would be so clear. And it is in many things, but uh, for a variety of reasons, we have not always agreed on what the Scripture is saying. And therefore, um, it is incumbent upon a pastor in many times, in many verses, to take a stand, to say, here's where I think the scriptures are taking us, and to have an opinion, and then express that. And uh, over the centuries, this particular verse and passage of scripture has been a, uh, a sticking point, has been um, interpreted by others differently, um, many in agreement with me, others in disagreement with what I'm going to say, but uh, I'm pressing forward anyway, and let me explain as to why. I'm of the opinion that as you read Scripture, cover to cover, you would come away from uh, reading it with an understanding that there are two great themes in Scripture. Two great themes. That if you were to take your scissors and cut out any reference to that, oh, there it is, it shows up right there, cut that out and cut out that one, one and two, whatever these two themes are, what you'd be left with is uh, just a ribbons. I mean, the Scriptures would, it would be much less than it currently is because these are the two great themes in Scripture. I'm wondering if you would say as to what they are right now. Would you be able to guess? I'm going to put them on the board. I'm going to put them up here, and you'll see them. And I go, oh, yeah, that's one of them. Here's one of them. One of the great themes of Scripture is that God is very much concerned about his own glory, that he deserves it. We've sung about it. He demands it. It's appropriate. It's good when he receives glory. And he's doing a whole lot of things on the planet to get people to come to the understanding of he deserves the glory and we are to give it to him. His glory is very important and it's a major theme within scripture. Along with that, a second one is this idea of man's salvation. What if you took out the concept of salvation from scripture, just not in there anymore? and God's desire, and God's love, and God's hope for reconciliation and restoring a relationship. He took all of those passages out. The praising of when it happened, the recognition of it, the calling for it by a human, all these things, you take it all out, well, you wouldn't have much left. You'd have a moral book, do this, don't do that, okay, but you wouldn't have the Bible. These are major issues in Scripture. It's very precious to God, a human soul, and he has proven it by sending his own son to cause that to be true. And when that becomes true in a human heart, number one follows right after it. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. This whole point as you continue on is to what is yet future in the history of, of Christendom, of those who are the believers and the followers and the lovers of God, is that there is a time yet coming, a city of God that is yet to be revealed, and that would be a place where God will dwell with us. He so much loves us, he will at, in a time future dwell directly with us. No sin, no enemy. It's like, oh man, that's going to be good. I know. I'm looking forward to it too. This is what the scriptures speak of. Verse 9, we already covered this in, our, in this second chapter. Remember verse 9? Let me read it. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's who we are. And that was secured by the work of Jesus Christ. A people for himself. He says, I want you. I desire you. And the thing is, is that this can be achieved he draws us unto himself. He only has one, one location where this can happen from, and that is from a sin-cursed world, from a world that is sideways compared to what God would want. He's going to make it all right in the end, but right now, sin-cursed. This, this is the world, this is the societies that he has to use to draw people unto himself. There is no utopia somewhere. Well, this kingdom of God's, these plans of God, these two great themes of God, is in competition with another system, with two other themes, though similar, are rather different. And that is the, the world system, and that is identified, two main systems here is man's glory. These are the two themes that are important to man, man apart from God. Let me just say, generally speaking, man's two great themes are my glory. I want what I want. I'm, I'm awesome. Check me out. Can't you tell? We humans, we are amazing. We are made in the image of God. And what we want in our sinfulness is me. I want my glory. I want what I want. And I think I know what I want. I think I know how to get there. And I'm chasing it. I'm running after it. I'm going to get there. I'm going to do it. I'm going to achieve. I'm going to obtain all of this. And that's because me is more important. Yeah, me and God, yeah, he can be along with it, but it's about me. And God is kind of attached on. It's all of us, all of us in our religious systems across the planet. And we have all of us, our religious systems, and we have a God that kind of helps us along toward these ends. But it's really about my glory. It's really about me. That's a pretty powerful theme on this planet today. Can you, have you ever, do you, are you able to recognize it? Do you see it? How about a second aspect, a second theme is utopia on earth. Utopia on earth. Because we're so awesome, we are able, we are striving to accomplish this utopia human society. We can do it. We're so smart. We're so gifted. We're so persuasive. We can accomplish this great thing. We can solve the sin problem. Oh, we know we got some bad things going on, and sometimes I'm even bad myself, but we can get over that. We can overcome. We can solve the sin problem unto ourselves. We don't need a God. No. We just need ourselves and figure us out a little bit better, a little more sacrifice here, a little bit there. We can transform a society through effort through knowledge, through certain achievements, we can get through the problems that plague us. And they, there are problems, and we can find it out. We can get past it. We can come up with better systems. That thought that I've just explained, this utopia on earth, is nothing new. It's been happening for centuries. I could submit to you that the Tower of Babel was all about that. We don't need God. We are awesome. We can achieve human achievement. And we're going to get there. We don't need God any longer. Hmm. God had an answer to the Tower of Babel. And uh, that hasn't happened yet. However, its effort is still present all around, the, or all around the earth. Just do your history lessons and see what people have been attempting to achieve. You have this kingdom of God and the kingdom of man question that begs after this is, which kingdom has a chance for success? Let's assume 
that they're just on an even par with each other. I don't know. Maybe God's system, maybe man's system. As you consider them, which one has a chance of success? Which kingdom are you willing to put your energies toward? Pick one. Your kingdom, the kingdom that you and a bunch of people are maybe gearing toward, and we're going to make this happen. We're going we're to make a go of it. We're going to put our energies and our resources and our talents and our time, everything, into causing this circumstance to come about. A man's type kingdom. Well, I know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we hear of God's kingdom. We hear of man's kingdom. We go, oh, no, 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 God's kingdom. Let's go with that one. Let's seek his glory. Let's seek the salvation of men. Well said. I agree. I thought you would say that. Having thought that and agreed to that, well, what are we going to do? How do we cause this to happen? If we're striving for God's glory and striving to establish his power, his awarenesses on this planet, what do we do? Well, we've already looked at a couple things just in a few verses. I mean, and we could tear apart the scriptures for all of this, but there's a couple things we've already just considered. Uh, last week, we talked about being sojourners and exiles to have a mindset of, I'm just passing through here. Build a kingdom here? <laughs> Come on. No. Sojourner, exile, just passing through. I'm seeking another kingdom. That's a mindset. It would be helpful to bring about the kingdom of God if that was our mindset, that there is a kingdom that is worth fighting for and committing to. Another thing we saw it last week as well was to have proper conduct, conduct yourselves in a certain way. Let's read that from verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Wow. So have a proper mindset, have proper actions, and in so doing, we're in obedience to God, we're worshiping Him with our obedience, and He will, He says, that will produce an effect. Okay? Today, in this struggle for human souls... Because that's the theme. That's the goal, right? In the struggle for human souls, we have some orders from the high command, from God himself. He begins to outline some things that we are to do. We are to have as part of our thinking and part of our actions are these things. And I would summarize even before I start into it by saying this, do nothing to hinder goal number two. Don't do anything that would hinder the salvation of human souls that would cause them to think other than the cross of Christ, to think other than who we are as Christians. Don't do anything that would hinder that, the message of Jesus Christ. And that's why he's, Peter is telling us, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Do good deeds. This is what we're called to do. So that's one thing. And along with that, do not present anything as more important. I mean, there are some important things to have on, on earth, I get that, but what's the greatest importance that you promote in your talk, in your actions, in your attitudes? What is the number one thing that you promote? Do you promote a utopia on earth? Is that what you talk about? We're going to change things such within a society, within a people, within a nation, that we're going to bring utopia to earth. Do you think of these thoughts? You're going to bring your Tower of Babel to bear upon the 21st century, and finally it's been achieved? Um, I submit to you, don't. Souls. God's greatest themes are His glory and human souls, that they come into right relationship with Him. With that as a premise, as a setup, let's look at the passage. Chapter 2 and verse 13. Let me read it. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him, the emperor, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Whoa. Some uh, commands given to us by God himself. And the first phrase I want to address here is in verse 13, where it says, for the Lord's sake. Oh, <laughs> what does it not say? 
for your sake. No, for the Lord's sake, in thought of him, to benefit what he has going, to join up with him for his sake, he's asking us to do some things. And because of what has been true of us, remember this is written to Christians, because this is true of us and we know what we have in Christ, and our response is, I love God. I am so thankful. Lord, what would you have me to do? What do you want me to do? Because I love you. Because I'm your child. You've saved me. What do you want me to do? For the Lord's sake. You see, it's already been demonstrated. It's already happened what the Lord did for our sake. Our sake has already been taken care of. The Lord did that in the sending of his son to live a life that was worthy to be sacrificed for the salvation of our souls, for the sins to be atoned for. He did for our sakes. And now, for the Lord's sake, we are called to do something, I guess in return, in response, as a thank you, as a love, as a child of his, Dad, what do you want me to do? And this passage is going to tell us. So the first thing to remember, to identify here, is we do what we do not for ourselves. What is being asked here is not so that you can have certain earthly standing, your glory. It's not for you. It's not to win favor with men. It's not to gain power. It's not to gain influence. I do what I do for those purposes. No, for the Lord's sake. If we are the priority, if it's for my sake, Obedience becomes very sketchy, very haphazard, very random. Maybe I do, maybe I don't, because I don't think that's going to work out for me, for my sake. And therefore, I'm not going to do that, because I don't like that thought. What will that mean? How will that play? For the Lord's sake. Oh, for the Lord's sake. That's right. He knows what will best achieve the goal. He knows. God knows. I'm working something here. Work with me. Don't work against me. Work with me. For the Lord's sake. He has a goal. He is bringing about his glory and the salvation of human souls. And we get to participate in this. And therefore, as part of this idea is, as far as these two kingdoms, it would be wise of us, it would be obedient of us, to show that this world holds minimal attraction. Minimal as a comparison to the, the world to come, the kingdom to come, that which will be true in glory. This world, minimal attraction. And there's some wonderful things here. I, I agree. And God has given them to us to enjoy life. I, I appreciate that. We say thank you to all those things as well. But again, keep them in a proper balance. We are to live on this planet in such a way that those who are not yet believers... They're currently unbelievers, but let's see them as not yet believers to desire a change of kingdoms because they're chasing the earth kingdom right now. They're chasing their glory right now. That's all they see. And it makes sense to them in their, in their sinful mind. They haven't been transformed yet by the power of the word or by the, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They're still thinking the way you used to think. And they still think it here, now, get it, find it, achieve it create utopia. We can do this. We can, and they're committing themselves to these things. And we're called to live a life that shows, eh, no, no, no. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but there's an eternal kingdom to be, a, to be connected to that we have the opportunity to bring, to bring to bear. And so for the Lord's sake, he's going to tell us to do some things. And what does he tell us to do? For the Lord's sake, read it, verse 13, be subject to every human institution. Oh. Oh. Every? Human institution? Lord, I'll submit to you, because I trust you. You're good. I believe in you. I know who you are, but human institutions? Be subject to them? To every human institution? Now, you might say, Peter, really, are, are you doing this on your own? To which, happily, he's not doing on his own. This command, this presentation of a worldview is uh, echoed by him and Paul and 
others, but let's take a look just for a bit of time at a couple of other passages that speak to this. If you turn with me to Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, again, it's... Uh, <laughs> Did Peter and Paul sit down with each other and talk all this stuff out and they went their separate ways, but you write your letter and I'll write mine and I think they must have. I mean, my goodness. How similar is this from Romans chapter 13? Paul saying, let every person, now that is really in a tense, spoken to everybody, but it's targeted to the Romans, these believers. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. If you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And it continues on for a few more verses. I don't know how you can misinterpret that passage. I don't know that you need a seminary degree to figure out exactly what that's talking about. Instituted by God. They are God's servants. Now remember, I said God only has a sin-cursed world to work with. He only has sin-cursed people to carry out his will. Some of those people have been redeemed by the blood. We've been transformed. But many of the people aren't yet. And therefore, they're still, God is going to use them. How? I don't get it all. I don't either. But I'm saying that verse is pretty clear. Turn a little bit further into the New Testament to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1, first of all then, again he's made some statements and now he's bringing a little uh, transitional phrase here as a result of that. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved. Can you imagine cutting that little phrase out of the scriptures? He desires all people to be saved. Cut that one out. No, that's one of the main themes, right? How many of those are in there? And there it is again. Who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, that's God's heart. That's what he wants. He's causing that to, to come about. And we are called to join him in this. And in part of the doing of that is to pray intercession, thanksgiving for all people, for kings who are in high positions. Okay, there's that. And then a couple pages over to Titus, 2 Timothy, and then Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Paul telling Titus, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Whoa, that's pretty straightforward also to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. A couple of words that kind of jump out at me as you read those passages and others are the words submit, honor, pray, respect. Human institutions and the individuals who are running those human institutions. Apparently. I mean, when you put it all together, you do your history lessons and see what's going on here. Apparently, civil powers have their place in God's providential plan. Civil powers. They're engaged. They're involved. God has, he's doing something. And again, civil government is a part of that. And our duty is to submit to them. That's what the word subject means. Be subject. Be submissive to them. This is commanded this passage and the others that I read were written at a time when uh, a certain emperor is running the empire. And before him, there was a guy, two emperors before him was another guy. The earlier one is a guy by the name of Caligula. I don't know if you remember your world history lessons. 
Caligula. Go study what he did, what type of a man he was, how utterly depraved he was. And the one who is apparently, as they put the dates together, the New Testament, some of these writings, the emperor at this time was a guy named Nero. Go ahead, do your world study. Go study your notes back there. Go, go look up this guy named Nero. This is who is emperor when Peter and Paul both write, be subject to the human institutions. Wow. These guys were horrific in what, who they were and what they did with their power. And it said here, we read, did we not read, that God has instituted them? God has somehow caused, in his sovereign plan, these individuals to come to power. Are they the only two examples of such like these men and women? No. <laughs> All through history. The Jews had to deal with a guy in the the dark, uh, the, the silent years from uh, Malachi to the John the Baptist, that 400-year period, there was a guy named Antonicus Epiphanes. Oh, abomination after abomination toward God's people. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, on and on. Remember, God only has sinful people to work with to carry out his plan. Here we are. We're not in heaven yet. And in this command... Where do you see the word rebellion, or overthrow, or anarchy, or insurrection? I don't see those words. I don't see that as our options. We're going to place one with another one? We're going to place one bad system with another bad system. Has that ever happened? We're going to get rid of this person, and rebellion occurs. Humans do it. They rebel, they rebel, they insurrect, they tear it all down, and they come up with something else. Has it always been true? That when this was torn down, this was better. Has it ever happened that this was torn down and this, what, was, what came next was worse? Whew. So, again, this cry, this call, we can bring utopia. We're the smart ones, finally. Finally, all those people, we've learned all those lessons from history, and now we are going to come to power, and when we do, we will be able to make it happen because we're the special chosen ones. We're the smartest. We're the best. I'm not sure what all this is coming from. All right. Does government have a purpose? Civil governments? Apparently, yes. Scripture, just we read the passage where that was true. And again, that is, generally speaking, to fulfill a very basic human need. That's what has to be done. We have to fulfill a basic human need, and government appears to be the best way to pull this off. And what is that basic human need? Order, justice, this concept of reward and punishment, this idea of have a big stick, have a big carrot also, but imagine if there were no human governments, nobody running anything. Ooh, you mean I get to be in charge of me? Yeah, you get to be in charge of you. But the problem is, you got a sin cursed, you're sin cursed, and the person you live next door to, he's sin cursed, and so is she, and them, and everybody is, and everyone's just looking out for me. If everything could be exactly the way you wanted in your sinful nature, would that be a pleasure for everybody else? Would you think of others first? No. And so, government apparently has this overarching job, responsibility to fill a need that we have, and that is provide order, stability. Anarchy, let anarchy rule. Eh. Oh, wouldn't it be great if there was anarchy? I don't think so. There are no street lights on Palmdale Boulevard. None. Yay, great. But there are no street lights on this way either. All the attachment streets to Palmdale Boulevard. And there's no speed laws. Do whatever you want to do. How long would it take you to get to church? Hours. Because no one's free to just drive 25, 35, or 45. Everybody is crawling up to every intersection just in case someone else isn't doing an idiot thing 70 miles an hour through an intersection. I don't want to die. So the government, would you put up street lights, please? Okay. Streets and then red and green and it all works out. Sometimes we're a little bummed. We hit a few reds. Oh, well. Life will go on. Okay. As opposed to take them all down. Take them all down. Anarchy. Anarchy. Is that what you want? No. 
I read this quote, and I liked it. I'm going to share it with you. It's, it goes like this. As far as what human governments are, a dam erected against the river of depravity flowing from a human heart. It's a dam, human government, that has been erected to keep the flow of human depravity from just damaging the whole countryside. I think that's true. With that in mind, are there some poor dams out there? Yes. Are there some government agencies that are like, hmm, not so pleased with them? Not so pleased with the choice of this, the choice of that, how they're doing this, how they're doing the corruption, bribery, scandal, on and on and on it goes. Is that going on out there? Yes. There's some poor dams out there. By the same token, have you ever seen a dam break? Have you ever seen in human society when the dam breaks and human depravity is allowed to just flow unattended, unstopped? Rwanda in our time frame. Rwanda was horrible a decade or more ago. You're familiar with a place called Somalia. Oh, you want to live there? The dam has burst. The dam has burst many times in human history. And anarchy and corruption become the name of the game. All of this is true. All of this is known. It's clear. And in the midst of all of these dynamics, what are we called to do? Be subject to every human institution. Wow. Are there any exceptions to this? Please tell me there are some exceptions. Because there is some vileness that occurs, some immorality that occurs, some horrible things that government promotes and allows and doesn't control and we wish it would do this and we wish it would do that but it doesn't it doesn't seem to be getting on the same page are there any exceptions to where we do not have to subject ourselves to the human institutions and the answer is yes i think you're familiar with what i'm going to say now and that is simply put when the word of god in order to be obedient to it then you're allowed to not obey the human institution. Word of God obedience. When the government is compelling me, telling me, demanding of me to do something that is contrary to the clear teaching of the Word of God. Clear teaching. It's just like, no, I can't do that. Now, I'm I'm glad that in Scripture we have examples that help us to put this together, okay, so that I'm able to identify the immoral, the evil, the corrupt, and then not do them. Now, if I don't do them, understand this. If I go against the government, the government is probably not going to say, well, that's okay. We understand. You can do whatever you want. That, they're probably not going to say that. That corrupt king, think throughout history, not just our American governmental system. Think throughout history. Some of the monsters that have ruled over other people. He's probably, she's probably not going to say, oh, that's okay. Anybody else? Okay, you too. No. Consequences may very well come. Daniel chapter 3. You want to turn there with me? Daniel chapter 3 is the story, a famous story. All right, It's a children's story. It's like, man, you realize what that is actually saying? And the children are just, yay, nice. Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. Nebuchadnezzar saying, worship me. Set up this this idol on the plain, and when the, when the sound happens, when the drums are beat, then everybody stop what you're doing and point your nose toward the image and worship the image. And these three Jewish boys, Jewish men, are going, can't do it. Not going to do it. That is contrary to the clear understanding of my worship of, of worship God only. Because I know what you're asking me to do. You're not just asking me to say, yes, Nebuchadnezzar is the king. Now, you're asking me to worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar as the king, as the great deity of the Babylonian people and of the whole world, because he's so awesome. And these Jewish men said, no, can't do it. What happened to these guys? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what happened? Did the king just say, oh, okay. No, this passage, read Daniel chapter 3 this weekend, this afternoon. He became furious that someone would go against his word. Heat up the furnace and throw him in. What is typically going to happen 
when you do all of that? Did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have every confidence that they will be rescued because of their, they were obedient? This won't affect me. Yea, Jesus, praise the Lord. We will be rescued from any consequence if we just obey. No. I mean, it's an amazing story because of the miraculous provision of God in it that they weren't burned up. I mean, when does that ever happen? But that doesn't mean that it will always happen. They could not obey the, the, the king's command. There's a story in Acts chapter 4 in the inception of the uh, Christian church. In Acts chapter 4, you've got Peter and John who are uh, ministering God's grace to the people of Jerusalem and the Jewish authorities are ticked off. This is at the time when Paul isn't even Paul yet. He's still Saul. And there's this persecution of, these, of the church. Persecution. And they are called in the persecution, submit to the human institutions. Okay, we will, except in Acts chapter 4, you see that Peter and John are before the council, the, the Sadducees, and they're, and they're calling them up on charges, and they're having this conversation, and you come to the great statement in the, the middle of chapter 4. I'll start at verse 17. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Don't talk about Jesus. We're going to tell them. They better do it. Hmm. So they called them, Peter and John, and charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John said, oh, obey every human institution. Okay, be subject to them. Okay, well, no. Here's their answer, perfect answer. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Figure it out. We've already made our decision. What do you think? God is telling us to do this, and we're going to obey you? No, come on. And it's a logical argument, right? And so it goes. Did Peter and, and John, did Peter die a happy death? Nope. He's called Saint Peter, in a sense, because of his martyrdom that happened later. Acts chapter 5, verse 29, you have another scenario here playing out. And Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. There's your out. There's the exception. When the government is telling you to do something that is absolutely contrary to the word of God, don't do it. How about the, uh, the midwives of Israel? When the Pharaoh said, kill all the boys. Kill them all. What did those midwives do? No. <laughs> So they, they, they disobeyed. Yes, they did. Because killing babies is infanticide. We don't do that. God is opposed to that, crystal clear. So now, that's not to say that if the Pharaoh had found out about the midwives, could punishment have come? Yes. Yes. But so be it. They're saying, I'm going to do what God had, had me to do. The martyrs, all of those who are martyrs, who have died because of their profession of the faith, and that was the reason for their death, all of them did it. They were probably disobeying. They were probably not going along with the flow. And today, our brother, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ somewhere are going to do that again. It's going to happen. They will, they will not deny Jesus Christ. They will not stop doing what they've been told stop doing. And as a result of it, they will pay a penalty. And some with their very life. The principle, though, is still solid. Be subject. Be subject. An example is given in what I think is a clear passage, uh, I mean a, a famous passage, in Jeremiah chapter 29. If you're familiar with this passage, Jeremiah chapter 29, you have a situation where these exiles, these, these southern kingdom exiles are being taken off to Babylon. Bad. Man, that would have been so hard. And the land, we're, we're being kicked off the land that God has promised to Abraham. And we've done some things. And now look at this. And it's, it's terrible. And so God, though, through Jeremiah, is going to give these people a promise. He's going to tell them. And this is a promise. This is a passage I think many of us are rather familiar with, right? It's, it, because it has in uh, chapter 29, verse 13, it says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I have sent you into exile. 
do remember that that was a specific promise to a specific people at a specific time. This was God's promise to these exiles as they're being carted off into captivity. I'm going to bring you back. I have a plan for you. So, so, when you get where you're going, do not rebel. Take your punishment, is what was clearly being identified to them. I gave you hundreds of years. I sent you dozens of prophets to turn from your ways, and you wouldn't do it, and now the penalty has come. And so you're going to go, you're going to go to to Babylon, you will be there for 70 years. In fact, all the people who go, few of them will still be alive to be able to come back. So go and make it your home. Don't rebel. Don't, don't change what I'm trying to do there. I've got, I'll deal with the Babylonians. You just go, they're being, you're being taken in that, in that regard. Do not seek to overcome Babylon. Do not seek to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar. You remember your Bible story about what happened in Nebuchadnezzar? One of the most amazing stories. I, I wonder what it would be like to have been Nebuchadnezzar, a man who was so full of himself. Oh, my goodness. And at the end of it, God did some amazing things, and at the end of it, he praised the name of the Lord God of heaven. Wow. Wow. So don't you Jews mess up what I'm doing with Nebuchadnezzar. You'll be there when all this is even going to happen. Don't mess up my plan. I've got Nebuchadnezzar. I'm working him. Don't throw him off. Don't cause him to have a, a poor view of who I am by you being rebellious uh, exiles. Don't do that. Your hope is the fulfillment of a promise to bring you home. That's what's true. That's your hope. Not to make this nice, but your hope is in heaven. And God has a promise for us too. We are sojourners and exiles, right? It's coming. It's not here. Do what you can. Bless it. Yes, all of that. But our hope is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there. God is accomplishing his plans through government and through authorities. Do you trust him? Do so. And if you do, be subject to the human institutions. Learn to deal with injustice. I know. I know. I get injustice. I understand it. Learn to deal with it. It's going to happen again today. Something will happen and you go, oh, that's not right. I know. What are you going to do now? Kick and scream? Be a fool? Go crazy? No. Carry on with winning souls to heaven. That's what it's about. That's what we're called to do. Those energies Work to change people and their hearts. Win them. Win them. Another, that's an example from Jeremiah. I have another example, and it's part of my experiences, part of my life. Um, you know that my father raised my brothers and I in what would be known as an athletic home. He was an athletic guy, so we're athletic guys. That's what he it caused us to do. And so I, I, I've come to love and enjoy baseball. You know that. I've shared that with you. And what is the number one purpose for having a baseball team? To be playing baseball, what's the number one reason? To win souls to glory. That's why. It's the number one reason, because that's what God's plan is, right? And so it's a gift from God to play baseball. It's a tool, though, to bring souls to heaven. So what, what is it like when I do not, if I were not to honor or submit myself to the human institution of an umpire. Do I expect that every umpire is going to make every perfect call exactly the way it's supposed to be? High school athletics? I'm amazed at the professional umpires in basketball, football, baseball. They're amazing. I mean, they, they, they even have instant replay now. And the number of times that the instant replay overrules a split-second decision is actually kind of rare. Those those individuals are really good at it. But what about high school? What about little league umpires? Well, what do we think we're getting there? Do I expect them to be perfect? I, I hope not. So since I know that they're not going to be, what does it serve the kingdom of God, the advancement of his cause, when I berate an umpire? When I go charging out on the field and make a fool of myself, yelling, may, not, maybe even cussing, screaming, demanding my rights, demanding justice from this umpire. 
How dare he be such a fool? What is the result of that? Because I don't know that the umpire, oh, oh, you're right. Let me change the call. My bad. I'm sorry. Thank you for pointing that out to me. That never happens. So what do I think I'm going to achieve? I know what I'll achieve because what happens if after the game, my team and I were, were over at Carl's Jr. and here comes the umpire walking in. I go, oh, an umpire. There he is. Hey, I want to tell him about Jesus, about my Lord. I want to tell him how I'm submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God that's coming and how earth doesn't mean a whole lot in these games. I'm going to tell him all that stuff now. Will he listen to me? Will he believe? He might listen. He might turn his back. Is he going to believe me? That I think heaven is more important than my earthly win-loss record on a high school baseball team? Has it not become abundantly clear to him who I am? And now I'm going to tell him about Jesus? That's just from my experience. Again, baseball's number one purpose is to bring people to the Savior as opposed to doing things that could cause someone else to think that Christians are crazy. They're disrespectful. They're so angry. They're so about here and now, some baseball game. Really? No. Baseball's number one purpose is to bring people to the Savior. And whatever it is that you like, whatever God has put in your life that you like, photography, rose bushes, piano, I don't know. It's to be used to bring people to the Savior. Other than that, sure, it matures me. I enjoy baseball. It matures me. It makes me happy. It's just part of my life. And thank you, Lord, whatever, all that stuff. Okay? But again, it's a tool to bring people to the Savior. How do we know that this is true? How, how do we know that this is what we're supposed to do? Because it says it right there. Look at your, let's continue reading there in verse 13. Whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good or umpires or tax collectors or water department people or the highway patrolman or the sheriff or the, or the, or the, ugh. for this is the will of God. Wow. This is the will of God. Lord, if I could only know your will, I'd do it. Lord, show me your will, Lord. Show me your will. We call this out. We desire it. Oh, show me your will. Okay. This is the will of God. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Submit to me. I know you're submitting to them, but you're submitting to me as you submit to them. This is the will of God. Do it like this. Man's way of achieving peace and tranquility on the planet apparently is through arguments and war and civil disobedience. And then we'll be all, okay, now we, we arrived. We got there through war and civil disobedience and death and destruction. That's how, and now we have peace. Yay, we did it. Well, you did it for a year, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. You haven't solved the human heart. God's way, as we said from the first verses, prayer, servanthood, submission. And what's the result? Well, verse 15. By doing good, you will silence the ignorance of foolish people. They won't have anything to say against you. They'll want to. They'll think they got to, uh, and everything they say will just, it's got, doesn't have anything to it. You are a good person. You are kind. You are honorable. You don't speak ill about anybody, even Nero or Caligula. You don't say evil about them or those Pharisees that Peter and John were having to deal with. Nope, you honor them. And though they want to say something, they got nothing to say. God is working to advance his church. He is. He is working to advance his gospel any changes that come in a society as a result of people becoming faithful to God, believers in his son, absolutely there are societal changes. There are personal changes that come to us, right? Byproducts of our salvation. Yes, absolutely. And in a society, if you get a number of people that are changed into the glory of, to the glory of God, to the, to the purposes of him, that will have an impact on a society as well. You may never change the government structure, but the society can change. 
You can have that influence, and Christianity offers that influence one person after one person after another person, one by one. God's war is a spiritual one. He told us that in Ephesians. He's all about the human soul. We need to remember that and chase after that. Let me conclude with a couple of statements. And these deal with what can simply be called civil disobedience. I'm going to disobey the civil authorities. What does the Bible say about these things? It's got a few ideas. Here's a couple, four statements. Christians should resist a government that commands or compels evil. Feel free. Don't do evil. Don't do it. If the government is telling you to do evil, like those Egyptian midwives, don't kill the babies. That would be an evil thing to do. With that in mind, we can work non-violently within the laws of the land to change a government that permits evil. So non-violently, get after it. There are things we can do. We can have an influence. A second thing we could do is civil disobedience is permitted when the government's laws or commands are in direct violation of God's laws and commands. Direct violation. Not some tangential way of trying to get there and finally we come up with an excuse. No, but direct. It's just the government is commanding and I'm not going to do that. If a Christian dis disobeys an evil government, think, Nebuch think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, unless he can flee from the government, he should accept that that government's punishments for his actions. If you can get out of it, I, I guess flee, if that's your choice, be a refugee, escape. But if you can't, and the government comes, consequences. And some people are saved from that. Miraculously, others have paid the ultimate penalty for not obeying what the government told them to do. They disobeyed an evil government. Christians are certainly permitted to work to install new government leaders within the laws that have been established. If you have the opportunity, vote. If you have the opportunity, run for office if that's what God would have you do. If you have opportunity to join a campaign for this or for that, whatever God's will is, figure that out, go for that. We are certainly permitted to work to install new government leaders who would be more aligned to what the scriptures would say for the betterment of a society, for the betterment of a of a people, that's okay. Consider that as well. But this rebellion, insurrection, anarchy, pursuit of anarchy, no, not allowed. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. That's a big call. That's a high command. And you know, it requires a high view of God to be able to say, I trust that. I don't know how that's going to work. How, how does he do it? Psst, you may get an answer directly, you may not. All you're called to do is just obey. Be subject to every human institution. Work where you can to bring change in a nonviolent way. Let me start, let me finish where I started. Some of what I've shared today has been contrary to what has been shared from other pulpits throughout history, where there was a rationale given for rebellion. Um, I, I, I'm a history major. I study some of this stuff. I, I just, I'm not sure that's what the scripture is saying. I'm actually quite certain that's not what the scripture allowed. Let's, let, let's be faithful to the scriptures and believe Romans 8, 28. For God works all things together for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. So let's just continue to love God. Let's, for his sake, I'm going to obey. I'm going to obey. I'm going to obey and let God have the results uh, in his timing. Let me pray for us. It's a high, high command that we've been given. Let's, let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to consider your word. We trust it as true. It is believable. And there are times that it's calling us to do things that are challenging. We're aware of the world in which we live and brothers and sisters in other places that even today will come into some very difficult circumstances. And I pray that you would help them to trust you, to be obedient, to trust you with what you are doing. I pray you would help this people here, each of us, to uh, live lives that are honorable, lives that are doing good, that we might even silence those who speak of ignorance about us. I pray that you would draw them unto yourself. 
And I pray that you do the great work of salvation in their hearts, that they too can come to value a, another kingdom, a city of God that is yet future. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If there's anyone here who is not certain what I mean when I say the city of God, salvation through Jesus Christ, I'd be pleased to speak with anybody at any time. Just let me know. My email's on the front of your bulletin. Have a blessed week.